to another episode of Control Up Community Radio. I sort of lied to you guys and said, you know, hey, we've taken so much time off. We're going to try to do a podcast every two weeks now. Well, now it's turned Friday podcasts. Maybe I'll change them to Thursday. But I like Friday podcasts because I think to myself, well, you know, on the weekend, maybe you're cleaning the house, you're you're walking, you're you're trying to avoid watching something on TV that your wife or husband is watching. And you throw in a podcast, right? You listen to me and chat with some really smart guy. Yeah, that's sort of the idea. So Friday podcasts. And I have a bunch of them too. And I am really, really enjoy it. I really love recording these things. I got to chat with such smart people. And I'm excited about today's episode because today we have a sort of a, I wouldn't call him newcomer, but not a, all of you might have heard this guy's name. And he's a gentleman from uh, the Netherlands, a Microsoft MVP. And I met him in Paris out of all places. I haven't been to Paris much, uh, but I met him in Paris. One of the few times I've been there. And super smart guy, super passionate person, and really loves Microsoft Tech. So I, when I met him, I thought to myself, I got to get this guy in the podcast show. So we finally made it happen, and I'm really happy. His name's Niels. He's a, nowadays an independent contra- contractor out there you know, helping big customers do really cool stuff. What else do I say? I'll let him introduce himself and sort of, uh, you know, just throw at him a bunch of questions and see what the expert has to say. This is the guy that lives in the trenches. So I'm really looking forward to this. Niels is an absolutely brilliant and really great guy with a great sense of humor too. So with no further ado, here's my interview with Niels Cox. Okay, Niels, thanks so much for taking the time to do this with me. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. You know, we met in Paris, out of all places, and I enjoyed meeting you then and and got to see you a few times and kept in touch and said, we always got to do this. And now I'm looking for it. We made it happen. Can you believe that? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, it was was really funny to meet you there in in Paris. I, I was on the floor of the MEM Summit and just an American guy appeared and he was really chatty and I was like, who is the person? But I I, I kind of like him. And then we went further from there. We went to dinner, and yeah, and the rest is history. I think it's, it's it was really fun. We took him out for dinner and drinks, which is a way <laughs> to make a friend. Yeah. So, uh, but it was Robin. Robin's the one. Robin Brendel's the one that introduced us. I didn't just randomly walk up to somebody. Sometimes I do, but I have to be in the right mood for it. But yeah, yeah, there was yeah a fellow techie. We started talking tech. So yeah. So that said, uh, hey, for those who don't know you, who are you? Can you tell us a bit about yourself? Of course. Thank you. I'm Niels Kok. I'm 32 years old from the Netherlands. I like bikes. I like barbecuing. I like tech, of course. That's why we do this podcast. I'm about 13 years in IT. Yeah, for some of the listeners, that's not a lot. But for me, it it feels like a long time. And I'm I'm a freelance consultant. For about two and a half years now, I'm in, in IT consulting for six. And the, f- the first part of my IT career was like system administrator. And yeah, I'm focusing on EUC, so endpoint com- uh, end user computing, and mostly focusing on the Microsoft part of things. And in my private time, I do gaming and bike riding. I like KTMs and yeah, games like uh, real time strategy or FPS or all that kind of stuff. Very cool. Very cool. Barbecue. I love barbecue. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, have, I have, I have like Kamado. Uh, it's just uh, the ceramic egg, but I want a smoker as well. Like Ooh, nice. in proper America, smoke is smoking. Yeah. Texas nice. barbecue. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, I just, I, I live in a flat here in Berlin and we're looking for a house. And, and one of the main reasons to get a house is so I have some place to store my records. But other than that is so that we can barbecue. And I can't wait. I just can't wait. In America, without a barbecue, is there's something wrong with that? Yeah. And do you want a smoker or like the the? Yeah, tomato? we'll, we'll start, just start off with a basic barbecue and then work up. You yeah, know, but uh, I would like something a nice big one that you know has all the options. So I'll have to look through it and see. You know, we have to see space too, right? Yeah, of course. So yeah, there's a lot to it, I guess. Freelance. So you're free. So I, I want to ask you about freelancing it because I get this question and, and I see this a lot. There's a lot of folks out there that are just like you, really talented techies and, 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 and they, they're thinking about going freelancing that, they, you know, and they're, they're on the fence. One, what can you tell them? What's been your experience? You know? Yeah. Leave it at that. 
Yeah, let's first talk about why I went into freelancing. Well, I wanted to choose my own projects and to be able to, yeah, be more like in control what happens in the project. I think for everybody who's freelancing and everybody who's a consultant, I think it's very recognizable that whenever you're in a project and it's going over budget or the investigation phase is not going correctly, so you end up with a whole different solution that the client needs. And that's when you're fully in control of when you're a freelancer. So you can, that's why I went into freelancing to be able to control that mostly. But it's not all rainbows, rainbows and chunk signs. You think you can provide like your own working hours, but in the end, you'll be working 10 to 12 to more hours a day. So yeah, it's, I work more, but I like it better this way. Very interesting. I agree with you. I work for myself too. And, and at the end of the day, what happens is, is that you do your job, which is a lot of fun, but you also have a bunch of other jobs to do too. And, and those aren't always so much fun. And then you have to track down money too, which is never the case. Uh, or and it's something that techies like doing, right? <laughs> no. Like money, come on. We just want to make it. I don't want to look for it. Come on. Yeah. So very yeah, interesting. The- and and you would you wouldn't go back? No, I don't think so. I don't. I will not go back for to consulting for a, to do consulting for a consultancy firm. I will maybe a vendor or maybe a a big company that needs that need really needs an expert. Then you can build a whole department for yourself and you can build a solution around that. That may be in the future because it's yeah, it's it's fun freelancing. And the, the things we do now, but it's 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 quite tough. And I don't know. We don't have children at the moment, so I don't know whether I'm going to keep up always. So let's let's uh, check and let's figure it out. I don't know. For the moment, I will keep doing what what we do. But yeah, cool, cool. Vendor's interesting. I like I like I like the vendor side, but it's it's interesting, especially for someone like you that's been at you know a customer assist admin and you know uh, work for a consulting. And now you're working for yourself. When you work for a vendor, you start seeing you see the other side of the the coin, right? Why did the why does the vendor ask for this? Why do they do it this way? You know, how the, you know, the puzzle palettes is put together, so to speak. And I like that piece of it. Plus you get to know a few things that happen before everyone else. And that always makes me feel a little bit cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the- yeah. It, 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 I think it's also fun to really build on a pro to really build a product and you can provide proper feedback because yeah when you're on the outside looking into a company and provide feedback that's way different when you're part of the company and you can see the alpha phases of a product and you can really steer where it's going and what business value is going to provide so yeah that, that's that seems fun as well it would be more like a product market managing role or product product manager something like that i don't know that that's yeah. that seems fun to me as well but yeah we'll see i don't know you got it. You got to find a technology you're passionate about, you know, and those could that company. I got very lucky with Citrix. I mean, I was an SE at Citrix, uh, but I think everyone in those days and probably for, you know, years to come and, and way before me, we felt like we, we all mattered. We felt like we were doing something special. And if I meet one of these guys from those days, we'll talk about it. And it's, and that's, if you could find that, that's pretty cool. I Joe was that way. Control ups that way. Is like it, you feel like you you can make a difference, and by making a difference, you're not just selling some widget. You're you're doing this technology that we like, you know. So, uh, and I think techies, if I could be so bold here on Sys Admin Day, we're recording this. Techies, yeah. uh, you know, we we love what we do, right? It's our nil, it's our hobby, it's our passion. It's almost dogma to us, right? In some weird way. Yeah, it's a second nature. I think you can describe it. It's just like. Whenever you would deploy control up at a customer and you can find out what's wrong in their Citrix AVD or whatever environment, and you can fix it in a couple of hours and show the pain points, that's uh, that's what, when they get really happy. And that makes me happy as well. Whenever yeah, yeah, some, some scenario comes up. Yeah, it's, that's awesome. Super cool. So that said, hey, I want to throw some, uh, so you're a pretty worldly guy now. You're out to solving some big problems, work with these big companies and and seeing a, this, that, and, and a little bit of everything. So I want to throw a bunch of questions at you, not all at once, and, and sort of get your views on it. Sound like fun? Yeah, of course. Yeah, thanks. Go okay. ahead. 
Okay, so we have 29 of them. So let's get through all these. <laughs> I think I did write out like 29. Of them. I did. I did. I had like 25 of them. I gave you 10, but we did. I said Be- 25. Bear with us. It's going to take the whole day. No, we won't do that. We're not gonna. We're not gonna get through them all unless he gives me really short questions. It's always interesting to interview people because you don't know what you're gonna get. Some people give you really short answers. You're like, "Oh, work with me, buddy. Work with me. Yeah, you help know? me. Come on, do it." <laughs> then you have someone like me that doesn't shut up you, know? it's like, then you only oh. get one question one question is enough and you just have a conversation no, that's exactly, fine. exactly. <laughs> so okay so here's the biggie one you know a, a big one uh, what are some of the common challenges you're seeing organizations face while adopting microsoft cloud solutions and how are you recommending and how are they overcoming them well of course you sent me the questions on beforehand so i could think about it a little yeah, bit well, you know and yeah, the, I think the most interesting part is, and the, the, the big difference is, is that when you just had the Windows Server as a release cycle, so four years, a new release, new operating system, you could prepare, right? You know what's coming and you want to build on the previous solution and it's more easy to get the new features implemented and look at it and just go ahead. But now, every month, the portal changes. In within Microsoft 365. And it's so big and has so many buttons and stuff that you don't know where to look. So you need to be a specialist or jack of all trades, which is becoming harder and harder and harder because you also have your on-prem environment, which is changing a, a lot. And so, yeah, I think the biggest challenge organizations face is just keeping up with the new features and how can they overcome them? I think they need to transform their IT department. So focus on automation. So the trivial annual labor gets out of the way and you can focus on adding more value for your customer or for your company. So you don't have to focus on the manual tasks that you do need to do every month because you've automated them and created time for yourself to get and knowledgeable about the new solutions and be able to keep up with all the new features that come up. That's, that's, I love it. I love it. Automation is one of my questions out of these 27 here <laughs> that I have. So let me find where that was, but now I know it. So automation's a biggie, right? And, and, and yeah, everything's being automated and we're trying to automate more and AI is definitely playing a part in that too. How has autom- automation uh, transformed? Blah, blah, blah. How has automation transformed IT? Uh, Maybe you can share some cool stories with us too. Yeah, I think this is the journey that a lot of companies still need to make. And it's hard, right? When you have worked for 25 years in IT and some time a guy like me comes along who's in his 30s and is going to tell you, like, you need to start automating. That's really hard to do. So it's the transitioning is slowly coming on. In the Netherlands, that's what I see. I don't know whether it's the same in the rest of the world, but I think so. And how it has transformed IT, I think, you know, Patrick van der Born, right? Yeah. Uh, he told me about a job where he was, he spent three years at this customer and I do something like it, but I think it's a really cool example. So that customer had a virtual desktop environment in AVD, in Azure Virtual Desktop in AWS, in Amazon Web Services, and on-premise in some data centers. And they needed to do image management for all those solutions. So they need to do updates and install packages and all that kind of stuff. So he created automation to create an image for each environment, but based on the same source code and based on the same sources application-wise. So whenever what environment you use, AWS, AVD, or on-prem VDI, it all has the same image. And it all uses the same update schedule. And you, of course, implement them via a, a ring deployment method where you do is, where you do DTAP, so development, test, acceptance, and production. But they all go through the same cycle and all have the same image. So you have really have a f- very predictable environment in case of image management. And that's yeah, that's of course end user computing related, but I think that really shows the power of automation because so many manual kinks have been flattened 
and they yeah it's it's really easy right because you can make so many errors when creating an image if you just do it by hand then it's really hard to always do the same order of installation and all that kind of thing so i think that really shows an example of how it has transformed or how automation has transformed it very interesting very interesting do you see do you see automation solutions becoming more strategic for these companies are they popping in there are they utilizing these things companies like soap for example you know what i mean yeah yeah i i've seen soap on e2e but i think and that's the hard part always about companies like nerdio and soap and all that stuff they do really cool stuff and they have really cool customers which do awesome things with those products but if you take for example nerdio and i'm not talking them now because i love the product and it's really good and i like neil and it's awesome but whenever you have a company that's going to move to avd from an on-prem environment and they have like a couple hundred vms and they have avd and all that kind of stuff and they want to move everything to azure you implement Nerdio, and then you have the AVD part managed. But what about your landing zone? And what about your the rest of your Azure services? So in my opinion, you need to be able to, to have a solution for all that kind of thing. So desktops, a landing zone, and all Azure services. Or you need to build it from the ground up using Bicep or other, la other languages to build it yourself. So you can do all your... Azure infrastructure as code and with the same idea and same philosophy behind it. So I like Nerdio. And if you're a really big company and you have other people managing the Azure infrastructure, Azure landing zones, and all that kind of thing, and they do it by code and the VADI team does, does it by Nerdio, fine, perfect. You do automation, it's, it's, it's cool. But if you don't and you only have Nerdio to do the automation part for your virtual desktop infrastructure, and you don't have automation for the rest of stuff, yeah, that's that's not really it for me because I believe that your whole cloud environment should follow the same philosophy. Makes sense, makes sense. So you, you've written ex uh, extensively about PowerShell. How critical is PowerShell in managing Azure and Microsoft 365 environments? Yeah, as I've stated earlier, I think it's, it's mandatory yeah. to, and you don't have to be a master of PowerShell to start with automation. Just start with the little things, right? You can just uh, use one-liners to configure a mailbox or enable a user or something like it. And after some years, you can write your own modules and manage, manage your environments via PowerShell. You can use desired state configuration or use your own JSON files to configure environments. So I think, I think it's critical. And I, if you, don't have the knowledge about PowerShell and you want to be able to automate a complete environment deployment, I think it's critical. And an example is also if you have Intune and you do autopilot, not everything is like in SSCM is available in Intune. You need to be able to create scripts to deploy everything you want to do. So it's I think it's part of managing Intune that you also have the proper knowledge about PowerShell. Makes sense. How is AI playing into this? You mentioned Copilot. You know, is AI good enough to, to help write some of this stuff today? Do you use it? What do you think? I use GitHub Copilot a lot, and that's because we get it in the MVP benefits. But if you ask ChatGPT, create me a script that that installs this application, removes the shortcut at this registry key and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's not going to work as of yet. It helps though, if you have, because the GitHub Copilot, that's an extension within VS Code and it follows what you, what you are writing. So if you create a comment and you say like, I want to add an email address for this domain to each mailbox in my, in my Exchange Online, environment as a comment it will write the code for you that works really well simple things and if you have a created a module on our function with a couple of parameters and you've defined the process right so begin process end and you want to write the synopsis you only have to write syn and then fills it out completely for you with examples and all that kind of stuff it's really 
awesome for the stuff that you don't like to do. But the actual programming and the actual scripting, you still need to do yourself. So you need to be able to understand, read, and write the code still. I don't think that's going to change overnight because it's really something that you need to interpret. And it's it depends on in your how you interpret a certain code and what thought you have when creating the code. So if AI does understand that, then it would be able to create the code accordingly, I think. But it's it's moving fast, right? So I think it was March this year where OpenAI showed the showed the the thing where they had a conversation with AI, which was really yeah. natural. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. And a year yeah. before that, they, they released ChatGPT, so things are moving fast. And I don't know when it's going to do what it just decried, described, but yeah, it's it's awesome. It's it's I, I use it quite often. I love to write little code and it's it doesn't write everything for you, but it sure does <laughs> save you from going to Google or worse, you know, Stack Overflow or something and get your butt ream for asking a question in the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, uh and it and it's it starts it gets I mean it's it's so amazing. But yeah, I mean you have to know what you're doing. You have to also, you know, build the logic for things and yeah. it's not a replacement. How do you say AI fitting into automation in the framework of actually or the ideology or i don't know how to say it, of actually doing the automation for you figuring out what needs to be done and then executing upon that do you see that coming soon well not really i think not at the moment for now because you need to your prompting need, needs to be really accurate to be able to get the proper output right and it's it's a helper i don't know whether you use github copilot in vs code as well that just your your pair AI programmer that it, that it reads with you when you code and it, it it suggests stuff. I think it's going to be it going to stay at the, at this level for a while, and because it's also quite scary, right? If the AI can create a code and it just executes it, and I don't know if it holds under the proper logics of PowerShell. I saw a session from Jim Moyle at the E2E about how to write PowerShell. And then he, he compared one of Microsoft's own PowerShell according to the Microsoft rules. Well, of course, it wasn't compliant, so that was really funny. But does the AI also use the same rule set to create those PowerShell modules and stuff? So I don't know. I don't know whether it's, whether it's going to be at that level soon. I don't think so. Makes sense. Makes sense. You mentioned Intune. So Intune's def definitely a big boy out there, right? So maybe you can uh, share some of Intune's, you know, what, what is Intune's role in managing enterprise devices today and, and maybe any recent updates that we should all be aware of? Yeah, like Intune is big. I think you see in the DEX workspace that it's big as well. Mm -hmm. And they are managing like 200 million devices within Intune. So yeah, that's a really big player. And in Holland, because we have the proper infrastructure, internet-wise, everybody's connection is like fiber and it's over 100 or 200 emits. And yeah, it's mostly that. And there's always areas where it, where it isn't, but the backbone is completely fiber, I think. So we have a really good infrastructure to have cloud-based deployments for Windows 11, right? And every company that I'm now working for wants to move to Windows Autopilot. And Windows Autopilot means that you have a configuration in the cloud with some applications and that you have the out-of-the-box experience and it's going to your device is registered as of now. And whenever the machine gets shipped from the manufacturer, Dell or HP or Novo or whatever, and it gets uh, registered in your tenant. And whenever your end user opens the box, slides out the laptop, opens it up, boots it, connects it to internet, it's going to recognize it's, it's part of your Intune environment and it gets the configuration applications that you want to have on the device. That's, okay. that's awesome. It really works really well here in Holland. I don't know whether it's in America and Midwest kind of territory is the same, but I can imagine that's, that's maybe harder for people living more in remote areas. 
But yeah, recent updates. I think the, the most important one is that Autopilot V2 is in, is in preview, public preview. And that's going to be a game changer because it's going to move from having the Windows phone, yeah, Windows phone connection method with the Intune backend to move into the Intune management extension. So all the the connection and the management will be done via the Intune management extension, also known as Sidecar. And that's going to be a really big change in connectivity and how updates to the Intune configuration will be delivered to your device. And that will be such a game changer that I think that Autopilot V2 is really something to look at. Wow, that's neat. That is very cool. We'll definitely have to check that out. Maybe get someone on the show to talk about that. Maybe you can come on and talk about that. <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll have a whole episode. That does that. That that is very interesting. You mentioned Windows 11 though, and and you know Windows 10 is going EOL. Maybe you can mention something. Talk a bit about Windows 11. The micro, you know, how migration is going. If you have any advice around that too. Yeah, well, it's 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 quite easy to start a POC, right? So if you have like thousands of Windows 10 devices and you don't want to, and you have people all over the world using different applications, you can just, you can just, it's, uh, I'm quoting quote finger in, in the air. So yeah, you can just uh, spin up a Windows 365 VM or AVD or something like that to test all your applications on whether they are compliant to Windows 11. And you can let people from all over the world log on to that virtual machine and check out whether your applications are compatible with Windows 11 and then create a test plan from there. So yeah, that's, that's if you use the Windows uh, 365, I hate that word. I just going to say cloud PC. If you use the cloud PC offering, then it's, it's really easy to just provision a machine for a month or a couple of months or so, or a couple of machines and then hand them out to the people who need to, need to test the applications. You can get a broad scheme of things that whether your application landscape will be compatible with the new OS version. And then, yeah, you can plan for forwards from there. I think you have, it's like in October, I think, that Windows 10 will be, will be end of life. Yeah, all my new deployments are all Windows 11. And it's not really that hard. If you have all your devices in Intune, then it's, it's yeah, it's not, uh, yeah, there's always going to be caveats, right? But it's pretty smooth sailing. It's good. It, yeah, it's, it's doable. Very interesting. Very interesting. I thought of a few questions and they left my mind as you, were, as you went along. But uh, <laughs> very interesting. I, I'm, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you say? What do you say? So I want to talk about Dex for a little bit and, and get your views about, you'd mentioned it a little bit earlier too, is, you know, how do you see De Dex fit into the larger picture of, of enterprise IT and, and what role do Microsoft technologies and of course, control up play and all that? Yeah, I think that Dex is really important because there's, I think, a global shortage on IT people. And the faster we can diagnose and solve problems, I think will benefit to having less IT people because they can spend their time otherwise. And I love this example always. So there's a guy who's uh, using a Windows 11 Intune managed laptop and he is in a team call. And during the team call, he gets bored and he uh, starts a Power BI and just starts loading his desktop or uh, his, his dashboard. And during that dashboard reload, his CPU spikes to 100%, his team's call, yeah, stutters and all that kind of stuff. But he the uh, he calls the service desk after the team's call. So he says, yeah, my team's are slow. And what the service desk's employee can check immediately whenever he's in Intune, and he can just open up the extension for control up. He can see his team's call, you can see the CPU be being used to 100%, see that the Power BI dashboard was reloaded, and he can inform the customer like, yeah, you were reloading your Power BI dashboard during your team's call, that's why it was crap. And that's a simple example, but you need those information to be able to diagnose those problems and really help the customer in an instant. And that's really solvable. And what Microsoft does is they, I've complained this about this as well at Microsoft because they give you averages 
So I get a startup score of 77. But what 77 is, I don't know. And they don't explain it as well. So what do I do with a 77? I can't do anything with it. A startup score. So I've talked to them as well. I want to be able to down drill to what the 77 has been compiled of. And because it could be the case that the 20, 20, 23 that remain holds my biggest issue. And the computer could still be slow within one of those points that I'm missing. So yeah, I don't know. I, I can't do any, anything with averages. I want to be able to drill down into the uh, raw data, but I also want to have a quick accessible dashboard that's created by the software itself. And I then think you have also like EG Innovations, which is known to be more detailed, a little bit more detailed than Control Up, but Control Up, you can set up in 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. And that's the really, I think, the USB and the power of Control Up. And that's why I think it will be successful. I think that's it. Yeah, yeah. Control Up, you can definitely, you know, we'll give you a score. We'll tell you a little bit about that score. And then you can dive into that score. And that's that's where the, you know, like you said, it's, it is nice. So to, I love these, these, I look at it as, the first thing I do is see, okay, do I need to care? Okay, yes, I need to care. Now I'll start diving into the problem. Right? Yeah, 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 exactly that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you got it. So uh, I have a couple more questions, then we'll send you on your way and get you back to your happy Friday. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so uh, uh, these are the fun questions too. So so what, what what new tech is exciting you? Is there anything out there that's that you're playing with or you're seeing or maybe something on the horizon? You had mentioned one a little bit ago, but anything else? Let's think about that one. Well, I recently switched to Mac and I saw Apple Intelligence and I thought that was really awesome. But now let's talk about the Microsoft 365 part of things. Yeah, I'm currently in a project for Azure Stack HCI with AVD and the performance is really good. So that is interesting because you have the VMware Citrix workspace where the licenses are getting far more expensive. But yeah, we're having some troubles in the project, but I I think once they're solved and the technology is more stable, I think that's really interesting because you have your hypervisors which are connected to cloud and you have a single pane of glass that you can manage your on-prem environment and your cloud services. And it was... It, it performed really well. The The machines also had a GPU and they had GPU applications where they needed to draw certain products that they, that they, that they are developing. And that, yeah, that, that's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Very, very cool. It needs to be more stable, but we have some problems now at the moment with this project. But if they are, if, if, the, if it gets stable to a really trustworthy really level, then it will be very interesting. No, uh, they'll get there. They'll get there. I have faith. Never <laughs> bet against Big Blue. Never. No, Never <laughs> you know, I don't think so as well. I, I remember. You've met my wife. <laughs> I, I remember this is about, about 10 years ago. We we're sitting in the kitchen and, and Microsoft was having troubles in those days. Azure really hadn't kicked up yet, you know, full speed. And, and you know, the Linux companies were starting to roll the world and the Facebooks and all this stuff and the Googles and and my wife is like, Microsoft's dead. And I was like, you, you're, you know, that's just not going to happen. She's like, no, they're dead. And she just kept in on it. And finally, I was like, you're a fool. <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I was like, you're a fool if you think that Microsoft. I was like, you'd never, ever bet against Big Blue. I was like, they will destroy everybody. And not in a mean way. It's just, you know, the Microsofts, they're wonderful. So, uh, yeah, well, there, there isn't an offering like Microsoft 365. There, there isn't just offering that, that really the, has the same feature set it just isn't there so yeah oh they're, they're the right people to do it you know windows 365 still has years to go you know it, yeah, it's, certainly, it's yeah. you know the, like the technology you're talking about needs to become stable you know i mean there's you know it's still we're still in the, ba the infancy of moving this stuff to the cloud you know you you would have to agree with that but where you know where it belongs ultimately is in the hands of the of, you know the biggest boys right and the biggest boys and girls and microsoft is that so Certainly. yeah i mean you would you know cloud pc that's the end game wouldn't you agree hmm. i don't know because i i have i was always 
in the last years about moving to cloud and moving to cloud is the end game. Uh, but I've come back from that, I think. It's it's always a use case. And the, the cloud PCs have their use cases, but they're, they're really expensive as well. So yeah, I, I don't know yeah. for sure. Oh, yeah. but prices will come down. You know, Moore's Law takes takes a hold, always does, right? Prices, yeah. things, are, they get faster and they get cheaper over time. You know, like I said, it's in its infancy. You know, they're still proving it out. The, the prices are still dropping, you know? Bandwidth is still, I'm in Berlin here. We have horrible bandwidth. You know, bandwidth is getting better. You know, you have great bandwidth, right? But, you know, long, long term or the long game, you know, the end game is something you just turn on and works, you know, no matter where you are. True. Right? It's, and and it, within the, the CrowdStrike, there was a guy on the on the MVP channels and uh, he had 2,000 cloud PCs and all of them run CrowdStrike. So, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so what did he do? How'd that work? How'd they, how yeah, did they, yeah. so that? within the cloud PCs, they make snapshots in every four, four, eight or 12 hours. So you can, you can configure that. So he, he re, he restored them all to the previous snapshot and that was it. He, he was up and running again. Yeah. Wonderful. He, he had some issues with bulk restore and be able to call the, the, the API and have some stock VMs. Well, that's like the, the the small things that were just that we just talked about that need to get better. But yeah, in in he was able to restore those two thousand machines over a day and a half, I think. So that's really impressive. If you mm-hmm. imagine that the airport here in in Holland, Schiphol, was really struggling because they had all terminals in the in the hall that were blue screening and boot looping and all that kind of stuff. So that's when a guy needed to go 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 over there and fix the machine manually. So if you can do it in a day and a half and restore all the machines, yeah, I don't, I, I think he was the only one working on it. So yeah, that's that's awesome stuff. That's amazing. Yeah, totally amazing. That's the perk. That's like I said, that's the that's the yeah. end game. But it'll take a while to get there. So, hey, I want to talk about community a little bit. And and you're a big contributor at a really great community called the Modern Endpoint Management Group. It's a LinkedIn group. Maybe you can talk a bit about that. And yeah, so how engaging with that that community has influenced your work and and maybe share a bit about, you know, about your experiences there. That's how I met you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's how we met indeed. Oh, well, tremendously. It we have a, a signal group, so we are always in in contact with each other. But, and if someone is an issue, and it's always weird issues, right? And that you can only ask to those type of people and you have a response in like 15 minutes. Someone will respond that when you have a weird issue and help you. So it creates a global network of experts where where you can ask questions to. And, and we see each other once or twice a year or maybe at other events but yeah then it's but that it's really like friends friends meet because we speak to each other virtually all the time but we only see each other a couple times a year in person so that's that's really fun and then we go out have drinks and and have dinner and all that kind of fun stuff yeah it's it's really good that's great that's great we'll see what is my last question i still have 47 to go 43 to go (laughs) (laughs) it gets bigger it's grown it bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> it, it's alive. <laughs> so for my last question is you're a very, very smart 32 year old, very, very smart guy. You were smart when I met you and you were 31. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, I like to tease young kids. I sound so old, don't I? It's horrible. <laughs> you're not young and you're not a kid. <laughs> You're better right. than me in every way. Yeah, so, I, uh, I sometimes feel old when I look down the street in, uh, in like Amsterdam and I don't uh, get what fashion-wise people are wearing or why oh. stuff is happening or I don't know. And then I feel old. But yeah. You know what? What makes me feel old is when I look at the sports people. Because, oh, yeah. you know, when you're a kid, you looked up at these, you know, maybe it's football, you know, European, you know, like football, right? And you're like, oh, look at that guy. He's so great. He's so big and old and everything. And then you're like, wait a second. He's my age. And then yeah. before long, you're like, he could be my kid. And then you realize, crap, I'm old. <laughs> How did this happen? Yeah, I'm now older than most of the people on the football pitch. So, yeah, yeah. That, that's, 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 that stuff that happened last European Cup. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah did you it, see, we did you see we, the guy from Spain who was like 16 and scored yeah. that amazing goal? Yeah, did you yes, see that? Yes, I did see that. Yes, he was I 16. Did. But, Six, 
Yeah, well, that's crazy. I didn't know that you had that in football. You have it in hockey. You know, you have the uh, there's a lot of young kids there coming up there, you know, very young and, and play hockey. But I didn't at 16. That's just that's phenomenal. He should be in school. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I think but, he hasn't. I yeah, think he, he plays for uh, he plays for Real Madrid. So yeah, I don't think he will go to school soon. No, <laughs> I don't think he needs. I don't think his children go to school. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anyway, so for those, for last question is advice. So maybe you have some advice advice on how we can make that type of money. So no, uh, <laughs> what advice would you give IT, you know, the kids out there, the true kids out there, or, or just someone else that's, you know, wants to, wants to learn more about, you know, Microsoft technologies, you know, three, 365 Azure, and, and also, you know, the stuff that you're doing around a community and things of that nature. The advice would be, Start to look at automation for Microsoft 365 and Azure, but don't forget on-prem as well because it's not at the big companies, it's here to stay. Hybrid is here to stay for at least decades. So to move to cloud only would mean that you need to cut out Active Directory completely in, in big environments, and that's not going to happen over the next decade. So if you get in IT and you're a youngster and you want to, don't forget on, on prem as well, because I know people that are in IT for a couple of years who don't know anything about on premises. They only know Entry AD and all the, the Office 365 and the Azure offerings, but not about the, uh, the on prem stuff. And I think the on prem stuff will stay important. And so, Get you get you get a general idea about this as well. You don't need to be an expert, but know what you're doing when you're looking at an on-prem environment. Still, would be my advice as well because we have a demographic issue in in the Netherlands where a lot of people are going to I don't know going to pension. I don't know what the, how you call it in yeah. English, but they're yeah. going to retire. Going to retire. Thank you. And so those people have the on-prem knowledge, so that will be a big gap in those kind of people I the, the gap is there already I think it's not only cloud the the world is bigger than cloud well now you just really honestly made me feel old because <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's kids out there there's there's people that don't know on prem yeah, yeah yeah I was in a meeting like Tuesday and the guy like yeah I don't only know defender in cloud I don't know on prem I don't know anything about that I You'll only see- do I only do the defender portal for the rest, I don't do on-prem. I don't know. You, you, you learned DOS, right? You grew up playing yeah, with yeah, DOS? Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. You're not... Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. so do you, do you remember Dr. Watson? I, we're going to end the episode on this. I don't know if... I've definitely told this story in the past on uh, probably DABCC radio, but do you remember Dr. Watson? No, I don't. So Dr. Watson was this app that was on Windows Server. It's probably still in there somewhere. But if you had like a an error that didn't blue screen it, it would pop up and it was the Dr. Watson error. And it would try to, I think the idea was to troubleshoot it for you and give you some information so you can help help you troubleshoot it. Dr. Watson was supposed to be your friend. So, but of course it didn't work that well. But this is, you know, this is the early days, late 90s, early 2000s. It was like the mics of troubleshooter nowadays. So that kind of thing. It's, it was Dr. Watson. <laughs> So, uh, so anyway, so I have a good friend of mine and he tells the story that how he was working at, at his company and he was standing at the cube of his friend of his coworkers and they're talking about how, you know, uh, they're, they're having all these troubles in the data center and like, Oh my God, you know, what's the problem? And his, his coworkers like, well, I got Dr. Watson everywhere. He's on all the servers. <laughs> and at this time his boss walks by and the boss looks at him. He goes, I want to see you both in my office in two minutes, you know? So they follow him in the office and he sits down and they look at him and he looks up and he goes, who the hell is Dr. Watson? He's wisely all over my servers. <laughs> like, oh, and my buddy's like, what do you say? What do you say to him? You know, it's like, how do you not insult him while answering his question? Yeah, that's going to be a toughie. That's going to yeah. be really hard. Yeah, I grew up in the time when you knew everything behind you because there was nothing, you know, it was just, it was the way it was, you know? So it was sort of nice because you got to learn it all, but then I stopped. So I had this giant gap between then and now. So anyway, Niels, thank you so much for taking the time today to do this with us. I, I, we'll, we'll have to bring you back on, talk more about Intune and some of these great technologies that are coming with, you know, like you mentioned, and I mentioned Intune is huge, right? It is Microsoft's platform for managing microsoft that says everything right 
Yeah, certainly. So I will. Uh, thanks for the invite, and would love to come to come back soon. Thank yeah. you. Uh, thank you a lot. Hey, well, thank you, thank you. You passed the audition. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Niels. Thanks. Cheers. Okay, that concludes another successful episode of Control Community Radio. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm definitely going to bring Niels on more, and maybe you can send me questions. Let's ask Niels all these different technical questions and what he thinks of this and that. And that's so much to dive into, in tune for sure. So we'll have to have him back on. Thank you so much, my, my friend. Very much enjoyed the conversation, and I look forward to the next. So on that that note, we do have a next uh, show for you. It's already recorded. I need to edit it, but I'll do that probably after I do this one. <laughs> and I'm really looking forward to sharing that with you. It's with a very old friend of mine, someone I met when I first started Citrix. And I sort of got to watch him. I did get to watch him grow up in this industry as long, along with me growing up in this industry and in the massive growth he's had and the changes and things of that nature. So we're going to chat with that. And he actually works over at Control Up now. I'll tell you about that, who it is next week. So I'm really excited to, to hear his takes on Control Up and what he's seeing and, of course, the industry and his, his interesting path. So on that note, yeah, excited for next week. So what else do I say? But thank you all for listening to the uh, Control Up Community Radio. Boy, you heard that flub, eh? So, uh, and I, I, yeah, what else do I say? Thank you. I, I don't want, I'm not going to start the ramble. I'm just going to go ahead and close this episode and thank you for listening and invite you to the next. And if you like the episode, please tell a friend and check out controlupcommunity.com. Check out controlup.com, controlupcommunity.com. If you go there, there's a podcast page and you can see all about uh, past podcasts. So definitely check that out. You can also see what is subscribed to us, but just, we're probably on where what you listen to. So just download, subscribe, subscribe. I'm going to leave you on that note. Please subscribe to the podcast. So in tell a friend on that note, thank you all. Have a wonderful week. Chat with you soon. Mm-hmm.